So today's talk is about PHP performance at scale. Um, just to give you a little introduction on myself, uh, I've worked on PHP for a little over seven or eight years now. Um, so in that time, I've learned a lot about how to deal with performance issues in PHP. The, the easiest thing to do is to take PHP and start building some website off of it. The hardest thing to do is to continue to use that code and get it to scale. Um, and so that's kind of what our talk is about today. So, so um, first of all, I think it's important to probably identify what we mean when we say performance, right? So performance is a factor of efficiency. So you have all these inputs and outputs, and you want to deal with them efficiently. And that's kind of the performance problem that we, that we get to, because as the number of inputs and outputs grow, this problem becomes really hard to deal with. The scaling part is just about sheer numbers, right? So you have a lot of visitors. You have a lot of data. The numbers are growing. And it's getting harder and harder for you to scale this app efficiently. Well, the problem with PHP is that a lot of people think that PHP is bad. How many here would agree that PHP sucks if you've ever had to write code in PHP, right? See a lot of hands up. Well, the problem here is that there's a lot of misconceptions. One of the biggest things uh, that kind of gives PHP a bad rap is all these little things that come out on the internet, like, for example, Rasmus Lerdoff had, at one point during a conference, Rasmus Lerdoff being the, uh, one of the founders of PHP, um, one point in a conference was quoted saying, PHP can run really bad code really well. This is true to some extent. But kind it yeah, it becomes a feature. Um, this clicker is a little. Okay, so kind of w what he's saying by this is something like this. You can take the string one and add it to the integer one and get a result two in PHP. In any other language, you get a disparate type error. Exactly. Right. So <laughs> PHP is not alone in having quirks is what we're saying. Yeah. Most languages, you'd get a disparate type error. Um, this, is, this is pretty normal in PHP, but for a good reason. This is by design. So back when PHP started in 1995, when it was just a pet project for Rasmus, this had to be this way because we were taking inputs from the web, which had to be parsed as strings. You don't know if what you're getting is an integer or a string or a float. You have to parse it as a string. The engine takes everything from the outside world and gives it to the client as a string. So when we do stuff like this, it actually makes sense because it makes writing the code easier. Can you shoot yourself in the foot? Yes. But what language doesn't allow you to shoot yourself in the foot? This is the least of PHP's evils. I think we can all agree this is not why people hate PHP. Another one that comes up. Function argument order. So in array map, you have callback array versus array filter. You have array callback. Well, that's a quirk, right? Inconsistencies in the function argument order, the way that we hand stuff off to the functions. Again, not the biggest problem that PHP has. This is one that comes up a lot. You take the MD5 sum of these two strings, and they happen to equal each other. How does that even make sense, right? You compare them, and you get the result as true. Well, what happens is these two strings happen to begin with 0, followed by the letter E. So what PHP does is a typecast. This turns into the integer 0, and that turns into the integer 0. And what we get is a comparison of 0 equals 0. Again, not the reason why PHP sucks. So why does PHP really suck, right? Well, if you think about it for a second, PHP has grown very popular very fast. It's one of the best, one of the most used languages as far as web is concerned. And this popularity happens to mean that all eyes are on it. All scrutiny comes on PHP. PHP actually is the first to fix mistakes before many other languages. When you look at comparison to like Python, Ruby, a lot of those languages made some of the same mistakes, but fix it slower. Well, in order to really understand what's going on here, we're going to have to go back to the future. I mean, well, go back to the past in this case. Um, and, and we're going back to identify when PHP first started, what was it really about? What was it designed for? Why was it even made? And it, this is actually an email that I pulled up, the very first email sent to the PHP mailing list when Rasmus released PHP for the first time to the public. And if you read it, it actually happens to be very interesting. 
for a number of reasons. He's talking about how basically he's using this tool for things like analytics and um, you know security, things that at the time, back in 1995, were not easy or obvious on the web. The web was a fairly brand new place. A lot of people were trying to create websites but didn't have a lot of technical know-how as far as how could they do this, how could they make it work. So you had to go out and hire an expert who would charge you a lot of money to build a website. He made it easier because he had already written all these CGI binaries that helped him do things like process forms, uh, handle web requests, uh, build out HTML templates. It was all written in C, but it was actually very, very easy to use in general for the time being, and it grew into this thing called PHP. So, why do we care about performance then? Right? If PHP makes our lives so easy to build websites and build awesome websites, why do we even care about performance? Well, the truth is we do because we live in an information age. Today, more people are on their phones, more people are using the internet from web-enabled devices. Some places that you might not even consider, so like for example in West Africa, uh, the only way you can get access to the internet is through your phone. The carriers can't build hard lines into those areas because of all different kinds of infrastructure reasons, but they can easily put up cell towers or use the satellites to give them access to their mobile networks. So you got more and more people online, that number's growing, and the data that they give to the web is growing. It's easier to build websites, it's cheaper, it's more cost effective than ever before. So performance does matter. Give you an idea of the data. So how much data are we really pumping out on the internet these days? I looked at this statistic as kind of alarming, if you think about it. This is a zettabyte of data in 2016. We're not too far from 2016. So a zettabyte is a really huge number, right? It's a lot of data. We have to figure out how to work with this data very efficiently. When you're only running on a couple of servers and you have to pump in a lot of data and you have to process that data, you got to think about how you're going to do that well. But the problem is that making changes, impactful changes, is actually quite disruptive. So it turns out that when we change things, we cause people to sort of fall over on their tilts and, and, and look at things a little differently. We create a little bit of disruption and people either reject or adapt. So Google started a project called Loon, where basically what they did was, how can we give everybody access to Wi-Fi all over the world? Whether you're at your local Starbucks around the corner or out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So they put a bunch of access points on these weather balloons, sent them up into the air, and tested them out. The idea being, if we send these things all over the world, we can give everybody access to Wi-Fi. It's an innovative way to solve a problem Quite ahead of its time, people didn't quite accept it. Same thing that sort of happened with PHP. So who, who writes a lot of SQL? Yeah. So people dealing with SQL, this actually comes from PHP. At one point, Rasmus was working on his personal homepage and wrote a statement that um, basically selects all of the form input from his contact page and dumps it out onto a web page for him. The database grew. And as that happened, the server ran out of memory. So he took a look at the MSQL server, not to be confused with MySQL, and decided to hack into it and write a little patch that allows him to add this limit clause at the end of the SQL statement. Limits the amount of data that you get from a result set in one query. Very smart idea, very simple idea, but yet overlooked. This actually comes from PHP. This was adopted later into the SQL standard and by many flavors of SQL. Um, but it's a performance impact. It means that you don't have to pull in all the data at once. You can paginate. You can limit the amount of data that you get. And this is kind of the ideas that PHP was built on. These very simple, primitive ideas of making things both easy, efficient, and fast. So the question is, how do you improve performance? And this is a hard question to answer. Because when I think about it, it turns out that everybody deals with performance differently. Now, performance is real, right? It's data, it's statistical, it's fact, it's binary. It's true or it's false. You either are performant or you're not. However, the gains from the performance, the results that you get from that, sort of vary based on need. So this, this one's a little bit more subjective. So what it depends on, really, for most people, 
is what you're trying to get now and what you're looking to get in the future in a very abstract sense. There are three main areas that I've found people mostly focus on as their companies grow larger. Most PHP-based shops will look to something that fits well within these categories. An economic performant app, or a luxurious app, right? Still performant, or something that just goes for sheer speed. Take a look more about what, what we mean here. Okay, so here, here's the economy. This is the Prius. Very cheap car, $24,000. Not that expensive, but it only goes zero to 60 in about 10 seconds. It does 50 miles to the gallon, though. So it's efficient on gas. Um, economy performance is pretty much what you get out of the box with PHP. So you take PHP, you already have session management, memory management. Um, the engine works out a lot of the micro-optimizations for you, even though it doesn't have a micro-optimizing compiler, but it does save you a lot of time. Prototyping is fast, cheap, and easy, right? And it works well enough for most people. Now, when you go forward from this step and you, after you consider, okay, we have something that's economical that works, but perhaps we want to get it to work better because now we have more users. Yeah. So here's, here's the luxury aspect. So the Ferrari here costs $200,000, obviously way more expensive. This is your development cost. You're investing in the people that have to write the code more efficiently but you're getting something that actually looks a lot better than it really is, in truth. Most people that invest a lot of time and effort into optimizing their PHP code find that it looks way better than it performs at the end of the day. And this is kind of elusive. When you're going for sheer speed, you're mostly focusing on hardware at this point because you realize no matter how much you optimize the PHP code, you still have performance issues, and you have to get better hardware. You use SSDs, you get more RAM, you get faster CPUs. You do whatever it takes, but you end up spending a lot of money. Is there some in-between? And the truth is, there is. The in-between being kind of like the Tesla, right? So you have this not-so-pricey car compared to its other sports competition, but it goes fast, and it saves you in the long run. You don't have to think too hard about how you're going to maintain this thing, give it gas, do all this stuff, you get the electricity for free, right? This is kind of the middle ground that we're hopefully looking for, right? This is the architecture part. This is where we have to rethink how we deal with PHP. Rethink everything from the ground up. This is hard to do for a lot of people because when you're rethinking something, what you're telling yourself is you've been wrong all along. Most people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that they've been wrong. But architecture has everything to do with it. Design is very important. Okay. So Rasmus also said something I find to be very interesting. Scaling something up is hard, but scaling something down, it's even harder. But they're both rocket science. When I first heard this quote, I thought to myself, that doesn't sound very right. But actually, it is. So you take something that works well for one person and you try to scale it up and get it to work just as well for millions of people, you run into a lot of challenges. It's the same thing when you try to scale it down. So, oops. So when you're scaling something down, you're taking something that's already working, but you're figuring out how can I make it work really, really well just for this one person. And here's kind of what happens with, with PHP. I think I broke it. There we go. So. This is how PHP scales up as well as it scales down. You take something that is basically where you have a load balancer, you throw a whole bunch of PHP servers behind the load balancer, and you have this MySQL server sitting on the side. You're distributing all your load. It's scaling up very well. You have millions of users, and everything's working great. Every time you run into performance issue, you just throw another app server behind that load balancer, right? It's the same thing when you scale it down. You have a shared hosting server. You're running one server with one PHP. And you have a whole bunch of users who all want to share the resources on the server and all use PHP together. PHP made both very simple from the beginning. 
So from day one, PHP implemented a lot of security features that most other languages didn't have, like, for example, locking down the doc root, uh, being able to restrict what files PHP can access, um, imposing limits for different users, having an actual time limit on the process. People writing bad code on your shared server might actually keep the process spinning forever in an infinite loop just by making a mistake and messing with all your server resources. PHP was the first one to have that timeout. Um, it was also the first one to implement the idea of limiting memory based on the heap, not based on the stack. So when you're looking at things like when you load a JVM, for example, you have to allocate all the memory. And there it is, sitting in the process. Now everything that uses that JVM is sharing it. PHP is more like, I'll only, I'll only get memory when I need it. Not Probably not as efficient as, as you might like it to be. But it, at the end of the day, it makes things more dynamic. It moves things along better. And when you use it in both of these senses, it works out pretty well. So when you're, when you're using PHP, um, so th this is a problem that we ran into. I used to, um, so I, I also contribute to the PHP um, source and PHP.net infrastructure, which houses the uh, PHP documentation. So one of the problems that we ran into early on was um, I was trying to help implement an actual voting system on the PHP manual. People add user contributed notes to the manual. Um, every time they see something, you know, a snippet of code, they want to add it in. They submit it, and it shows up on the site. So people wanted a rating system to kind of like say, OK, well, let's weed out the really bad things um, that people contribute. You know, every now and then, somebody introduces like an eval or something, and then everybody goes crazy and is like, take it down. Um, nobody had time to like do that manually. So we just wanted to like automate the whole thing. But the code is really old. The infrastructure is really wonky. And it's kind of hard to do this. But PHP actually made this a little bit easier. What happened here is that we have all of these uh, mirrors that mirror the documentation. They basically just rsync all of the PHP scripts. And each of these servers will be housing the same exact thing. So it's just a mirror. There is some round robin DNS. So based on where you go to like php.net, it'll kind of direct you or point you into uh, the server that's closest to your area. So obviously, no one server can take on the load of that thing. It's like way too many people go to the manual. Um, so this made the, the challenge both hard and a little bit easier than I thought. The problem is that you kind of have to deal with everything separately. You can't assume that you know anything about how the server runs, what kind of hardware it's running, what kind of software it's running, what the actual stack is. You just know that it's running PHP, more or less. So PHP makes it simple because every PHP script can be read the same way. You start with an empty heap, an empty stack, no initialized classes, no initialized variables. You're starting from the bottom up, basically. And as you go through the code, you can pretty much make good assumptions about how the code will run in different environments, more or less. So when doing this and putting some thought into how we can like synchronize all of these things, it turns out you don't really need a centralized process to do it. Um, rsync and, and, and a centralized database with some API calls worked out just fine. Um, and this made things a little bit more efficient than I thought they were going to be, because we can do a lot of the computation on each of the individual nodes as the requests come in, and then sort of share that information in not so real time later by syncing back to a central database and then updating. Um, and then as the rsync job comes through, the information repopulates. So you get a little bit of inconsistency in the data, but eventually everything works out just fine. Um, and this kind of helped with the design. I didn't have to think too hard about how to implement all this stuff. In terms of like how well it's going to run, well, we already know all these servers basically can run the code separately, so we don't have to worry too much about making it really perform it. But it works. So here's a myth. PHP FPM is faster than mod PHP. A lot of people, when they consider performance issues, they think, should I change from mod PHP to PHP FPM? Well, there's kind of a truth and there's kind of a lie behind this, uh, what most people think. It's not really what you think. PHP FPM and mod PHP are the same exact thing. They're just PHP. The only difference is that FPM stands for Fork Process Manager. What this does is it forks the PHP workers for you and manages all of those process, processes. Um, whereas Apache already does that for its web server workers. So all that happens, the difference between Apache and uh, PHP FPM is that in Apache, you're, you're basically loading a shared object, which is mod PHP, into the Apache server. It's forking its uh, web server workers, each process already having that binary contained within it. 
So when you come in to serve, say, a static request, like a JavaScript file, CSS file, HTML file, you're using one of the workers that has the PHP binary loaded into it. So that means you're occupying that worker. And it's kind of bloated. It's a little bit heavy, a little bit of memory, a little bit of overhead. Um, but at the end of the day, it runs PHP just the same. So PHP request comes in. You also use the PHP worker. With PHP FM, you're kind of separating the two. So say you're running Nginx, for example. So you have the Nginx web worker sitting there. They're going to take on the web request. If it's a static request, it doesn't need to go off to PHP. If it is a static request, then it goes off and gets served by PHP. And then over a fast CGI socket, you're talking back to Nginx and sending the result. So if you, get, if you, if you do this on a single server, you are getting some performance benefits. You're getting performance benefits because your static requests don't have to be served up by this PHP binary. If you're separating out your load properly, though, and we'll talk about load distribution in a second, if you're doing proper load distribution, you wouldn't have this problem anyway because you'd have one server dedicated for your application serving the PHP and another server serving up the static request. So you can have Nginx, which is very good at serving up static requests fast, sitting on one server and doing that, going down a, a route to the load balancer, and all the rest of the PHP code being served by Apache is fine. Apache is easier, in my opinion, to configure, set up, and get it up and running, has less problems less problematic with the with the fork process manager. Fork process manager, as far as PHP 5.1 was concerned, was pretty bad. It was a pretty horrid implementation. Had a lot of bugs, a lot of problems. It got better in 5.2, finally got integrated into PHP in 5.3. Um, so it's, it's much better now, but in my opinion, I'd still go with Apache every time. So distributing load properly. OK, so here's kind of the performance benefits that you get out of this. When you think about this, so say you want to have this load balancer set up where basically the load balancer is the one taking all the requests and then distributing them evenly across these PHP servers. Then you have these static servers sitting over here, and the PHP servers talk to the database server. So doing this kind of load balancing is pretty typical in most applications. The one thing you have to consider here is how are you going to deal with sessions, right? This comes into the application layer. So you want to distribute your sessions, too. You're usually going to use something like memcached. The problem with memcached is if you run a memcached server on each one of these PHP servers, and they're com as the request comes in, they, they open a connection to all of the memcached servers and try to figure out which one stores the session or if you're doing like duplication, you run into a lot of problems. Because if the memcached link goes down, you have to reestablish the link again to get the hashing algorithm that you're going to use to talk to the other memcached server. This creates problems in your code. You kind of have to like code around it. Really tricky. If you use the memcache extension in PHP, not the memcached ending with a D, you actually get that for free. So that's another thing to consider in terms of like performance, because you might have to have additional connection overhead. However, you could have a dedicated session memcache server sitting as well that you only talk to one endpoint. Some people use things like Elastic Cache. That's another option. But there are design considerations here in terms of performance, because not only could it fail, it could also cost you an additional overhead. As you're distributing load, you're thinking about distributing data as well. So that's, that's kind of where that falls in. Another thing that you always have in every application is how do you deal with the really bulky out-of-band processing that you kind of have to do sometimes? So let's say you have this analytics job where you get a request in, and it has to compute some data and crunch some numbers, do a whole bunch of stuff, and then update the database, or memcached, or whatever. Well, the kind of thing that you really want to use Gearman for are these jobs that don't belong in the web request. What I mean by that is that when the request comes in from through over HTTP to PHP, you have to wait for PHP to finish whatever it's doing before you can close that connection. There are ways to sort of trick it with like FPM, for example. You can do a fast CGI shutdown request, which will terminate the actual socket connection to the client and have PHP continue on its merry way to do whatever work is left to be done. But that means you're also still occupying an entire PHP worker until that job finishes. If that job happens to take 10, 15, 20 minutes, that's, you're, you're using up resources a bit inefficiently. So move it out of, it's not, I'm not saying you don't have to use PHP. You can, you can use PHP if you want to, but move it out of the web request. And Gearman does a great job at this. Because all Gearman's doing is it's giving you this application server that you're going to send some work to, and it's going to run the workers, it's going to handle the 
job ID and distributing to the workers and all that kind of thing. Run the workers, finish the result, do whatever it has to do. So that, that works out great in terms of doing the offloading. There are other ways to do it, too. So this is kind of like, in a nutshell, an overview of kind of the things that we talked about in terms of offloading. From the top down, here's your load balancer. You're going to Nginx. You have a static request. If it's static, it goes to the CDN. If not, it goes to the application. Then there's Apache. And all the way down here, you do the offloading. So the decision to offload should happen in the application layer. The things you want to consider is when we do the offloading in the application layer, what kinds of jobs really should be offloaded and what kinds of jobs shouldn't. Well, there are a couple of key decisions that I found make sense in the long run. One of them being, if the web request has to send something immediate to the server. So for example, um, a Yahoo, they have to send out, uh, they have to do a lot of ad responses. So you get a request in, it does an IP lookup in the background, figures out the geolocation data for the client, then has to decide whether which ad to send based on geolocation. So what happens is they use uh, MySQ, the MySQL I extension in PHP, which allows you to do asynchronous queries. So they move the actual query work in terms of like asynchronicity away from the engine and continue to pull, you know, compute the data that's going to do the page, send the response back out to the client as soon as possible, right? So flush that data back out to the client and then continue to wait on the ad server to pull up the result from MySQL and then send the actual ad response back out to the client. So this is kind of an offloading step. It's similar to what we're talking about here. But it's important because it matters. If you're waiting that extra two to three seconds to get the response back from the ad server, you're, that's two, th two to three seconds with a white page where the client is staring at it, nothing loaded. Versus now, the client can just see the page right away, and that two to three seconds is spent spinning up the ad server until the ad actually pops up. So that's something to consider. That's, that's a performance um, issue, and that matters at the end of the day. It's user experience as well. Another way to do this is sort of um, offloading with queues. So messaging queues are really great. One of the things that I found to be really horrible about them, though, is that if you try to centralize them, or as you try to centralize them, um, you, get it, you run into a lot of complications in your actual application logic. It becomes so hard to figure out failure, recover from it. Um, there are simpler ways to do it, though. I've, I've tried, for example, using 0MQ, which if, if you know anything about 0MQ, it's basically like, like TCP on steroids. Um, it's really interesting, though, because what you can do here is say you have a bunch of these app servers that feed in requests, and as the web requests are coming in, um, you're having to do all this offloaded work. So what we do here is we basically open a TCP socket to the local loopback. We send out some data into the queue. Local loopback is gathering the data, and then that gets queued up. So the worker, the one that's pulling, this is like a simple push-pull, basically, the one that's pulling is also spinning up on the same server. Um, let's say they're running like in some daemon process that pulls in the data from the local loopback and then pushes it out to the public IP here, which is over the LAN. Then there's some consumer at, on the other end in a different node that's pulling in the data over the LAN. So kind of the reason why we, we do something like this is because, number one, you don't want to lose the data in the queue. If any one of these servers happen to go down, you don't have a single point of failure. But at the same time, um, if that server goes down, you don't have a single point of failure either. The one that's pushing and pulling from here makes sure that this stays local so that if this link fails, you can still keep the data on the server here. And ultimately, once this worker comes back up, it can continue to feed the outside consumer. Looks a little weird at first, but when you think about it, turns out it works pretty well. One of the problems you get here is sort of configuration. So if you do service discovery with Zookeeper, this helps a lot. So now you're thinking more like service-oriented as opposed to actual what you're, how you're going to work out all the configuration details um, and just let you know, Zookeeper is distributed, so you know, it works pretty well, uh, gets eventual consistency. So that's kind of that's kind of the way that you deal with some of those offloaded processes. This helps a lot in terms of performance. Anything that you're doing inside PHP that's taking longer than a few hundred milliseconds, you probably shouldn't be doing it in PHP, right? You're, you're taking that much time to send the response basically to some HTML. You might want to think of offloading that work and, and figuring out a more efficient way to do it. Data aggregation is also important. Uh, query caching is important. PHP helps with a lot of these areas. You have, if you, if any of you ever use the uh, pickle repository, uh, pecl.php.net, 
it contains a lot of really good extensions down this area. So for example, you have uh, MySQL, uh, MySQL ND, which is the native driver for MySQL and PHP, query cache extension. Kind of transparently caches queries as you talk to MySQL. One of the ways that it works is that basically the MySQL native driver that was built for PHP different than libmysql um, hooks, allows you to hook directly into the engine, into the API, and you can sort of add callbacks of your own to, to do custom things. So this one specifically adds itself into the query callback so that whenever you send that query, you can make a decision whether or not it should fetch it from cache or go directly to the MySQL database. Um, and it makes that decision by talking to memcache directly. So you know you, you get a lot of added benefits there. Um, there's another one for load balancing MySQL as well. So those are some uh, extensions that might help you out in that area in terms of like performance. Makes it very easy in PHP though, and you can add your own custom callbacks to it to make to do logical decisions about how to cache and not cache. Another area of, of performance that PHP sort of offered with APC. Um, so APC stands for uh, Apache PHP Cache, or Alternative PHP Cache, I think. And uh, and uh, a lot of people thought that maybe they could use this as opposed to memcache or in in sync with memcache. There there are differences though. APC is local, so it's per process. When you're running the PHP process, so like if you're running mod PHP, you have one parent process, you fork a bunch of children, so that means the parent process is the one with the actual SHM for for the for the cache. Um, memcache can be distributed though, so you can connect to it over TCP/IP. APC lives inside the actual process memory, so it's super fast. To give you an idea of the differences, I benchmarked it, and I think it's about three orders of magnitude faster than talking to memcached. It's really fast. Um, whereas memcached, you sort of have to do this thing where like, you, you do well the hashing, and then you send it over the socket, and you have the connection overhead. So there's a bit of overhead with memcached, but memcached works better in distributed fashion. This works better locally. Things that you might actually want to cache locally are things that probably you're, you're computing on a non-consistent basis. So if you have processes that sort of update like cron jobs and things like that, email lists, different things that you sort of need to keep around but don't want to constantly recompute, you can stick those into APC cache. And that's, so that's the data cache, not the opcode cache. And, and uh, that speeds things up significantly because you can fetch them very, very fast in PHP. Another thing that you always want to consider in code, atomic operations matter. They really do. So when you refactor code that's sort of, OK, so some people really are sticklers for this one. Um, so this is, should we use count inside of a for loop? Or should we like memoize it and then stick it in a variable and just use that instead? If you look at the actual performance differences, and it, the, size or the size of the array here doesn't actually matter, just so you know. Um, when you do a count on a PHP array, it's an atomic operation. It does not iterate over the entire array. It reads a single integer inside of a struct. So as you can see, the, the differences here are exactly 14 nanoseconds. That's the difference between a, a, an array of 100,000 and an array of 10 elements. 14 nanoseconds, there's absolutely no difference. That's negligible. That's just like overhead. Yeah. But, but that's negligible. You can't, I mean, 14 nanoseconds. You can't even, that's just like something in the, in the task scheduler. That's, but yeah, the, you really don't even want to consider it. Um, in terms of like the cost of a function overhead, though, in PHP, now th this is the tricky part, though. The, the cost of calling a function in PHP is actually expensive. That part is true. So if you're using count in a for loop over like a million iterations, yeah, you're, you're going to get overhead. Yeah, that's bad. Right? That's, I'm not saying do that. But in terms of like, some people think that, oh, don't use count. You should actually you know, do all these hacky tricks to like keep track of the size of an array. Don't. You don't have to micro-optimize there. PHP does it for you. It makes sure that the operation of looking up the size of an array is atomic. It's already giving you that out of the box. So that's not worth your time. As a developer, your time is more costly than the machine time. 14 nanoseconds cost you nothing. A developer spending an hour trying to figure this out costs. So, and this comes back to like understanding how some of these things actually work in PHP. So, if you're familiar with vectors, this is what a vector looks like in, in, in C, like an array, right? So you have you have chunk memory where basically we divide it up evenly based on the fact that we have an integer array here. So it's divided up into like four byte offsets, and based on the offset, you do some pointer arithmetic and you get the value that you're looking for inside the vector. Great. That's not how a PHP array works, though. Not at all. This is what a PHP array looks like. 
very different. Very scary, but very different. Um, hash table at the top. So what the hash table does keeps track of the head and the tail, right? And it has a, a struct that also contains some other integers, like number of elements, the size, uh, the next free integer, and the bucket array, which is actual a pointer to another array. This is an actual vector. Here, here's what's happening here. This hash table is what's copied around in most cases. Some people believe that it is a performance optimization to use a reference in your function signature because arrays are expensive. It is not. I assure you it is not. Here's why it's not. The size of this hash table is about 32 bytes, depending on if you're 32-bit or 64-bit. It's not very big. That's what's copied around. That's all that you copy around from function to function, unless you write to the array. Then you have a problem. The buckets basically represent the values or the elements in the array. They represent both the key and the value, so the key value pair, right? The C array, the, the C bucket array down here in orange, is just a vector that keeps track of the pointers for each of these buckets. That's all it is. So this really complicated structure is so abstract that you can use it like an array, like a map, like a hash table. You can use it as a bunch of different things, and it works just fine. It works for the average person without understanding how it works. But it is a performance optimization. And so this brings us to implementation. Now, when you think about implementing things, um, PHP is already implemented pretty well as it is. Um, and I think a lot of people use the, so the CPHP, which is like the standard PHP, right? Um, a lot of people use it for what it's really, really good for. It's just out of the box, quick to prototype, quick to get things up and running. And then over the long run, you can find all these really great frameworks that do a lot of the heavy lifting for you and make, you know, simplify your entire process of writing code. And they're vetted and, and it, they figure out a lot of performance problems and they kind of deal with that as they go. Facebook came up with something called HHVM. Now, this is a little different than PHP. Um, if you think about it, most people actually are, are pretty confused about exactly what hip hop or HHVM or, or, or um, the JIT or what all those terms actually mean. Kind of to give you a little clarity on that, um, HHVM is a project that came out of something called HPHPC, which was hip hop PHPC. What that was at the time was the hip hop PHP compiler. They took actual PHP code, translated it into highly optimized C code, and then compiled that C down into a binary that ran all of the PHP. Not the PHP, but ran the program. That ultimately turned out to be slower than PHP itself. So instead, they came up with a re-implementation of the entire PHP virtual machine called HHVM. When this came out, um, it still wasn't nearly as fast as they wanted it to be initially, but it turned out to, get to offer a lot of benefits. One of them being that, for example, you can write actual PHP extensions in PHP in HHVM. Um, another one being the JIT. The JIT is the just-in-time compiler. Okay, so you're talking about static, that's hack. Um, okay, that's a, a little different, but yeah, also sort of considered in this, in this mesh called HHVM. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but one of the greatest benefits here was, was the JIT. The ability to take uh, PHP code and translate it into x86 binary, right? So you're, you're getting so level, you're getting so low down to the guts of the machine at this point that you're just sending the processor, you're sending the CPU some x86 instructions to, to, to basically translating PHP into x86, get it to run really, really fast, and making decisions on the fly about how to optimize the code path. This is really hard to do, though. I mean, Facebook has a lot of resources and a lot of engineers, so they spent a great deal of time doing this, but it took years to get here. PHP works fast enough that we're actually going to see how, in some cases, it beats HHVM without all that magic. Um, Falanger is, is like a translator, more, more or less, uh, but it's another implementation, I believe. PHP PHP is an implementation of PHP in PHP. It, no, it works. This is not a joke. It's, it's real. Yeah, it's real. Uh, actually, uh, Anthony Ferreira, uh, who works at Google, was the one to work on this uh, initially. And uh, the idea to me was, was a bit laughable at the time, but it turns out that actually there are some benefits to this. Uh, some other additional projects came out of this, and if you want to chat about that later, we can. Um, so this was a really interesting implementation. But these are, these are the most sort of current, I think, popular implementations. There, there's some others. Um, but now the future of PHP. 
Yeah, there's no six, in case you haven't noticed. So that's an interesting question, actually. So at the time when PHP 6 started, um, the idea was that we were going to move to all of this UTF-8 stuff. Uh, that, that changed so many things inside the engine, a lot of the API um, calls, that people, extension maintainers were not happy with the results. Uh, they were like, okay, we're changing way too much. Um, and this is not going to work. And the time that was dedicated to actually sit down with the PHP internals guys and like talk about this never happened. And so ultimately, the whole branch just got scrapped. And it was just like, let's kill it and move on. And then PHP 5.4 came out. Um, so now, PHP 7, which sort of started as this branch called PHP NG or PHP Next Generation, is actually pretty freaking interesting. Um, I looked at a lot of the, the sort of like changes inside. There, it's it's not like a complete rewrite, but there's been a lot of work inside the actual PHP virtual machine, the engine. So it's called the Zend engine. Um, a lot of changes in data structures, compacting data structures. Um, one of the biggest performance issues I always see profiling PHP code is dealing with strings and arrays. Strings and arrays are always your biggest performance bottlenecks. You have to constantly do all these memory hits to get to them. Um, and and while they're 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 very uh, efficient in terms of CPU. They're costly in terms of memory, so they're not well compacted. PHP 7 solved a lot of these problems pretty well, I think. Well enough. Um, so this is Zen Zend Engine 3.0, I guess. Here's some uh, initial benchmarks. I'm not sure how up-to-date these are. I kind of lost the original slide for this, so I had to like whip this up on the, on the fly. So it, 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 it turns out, actually, that HHVM doesn't run nearly as well as we think it does on some of these frameworks that we're tested out on. Here's some of the answers. Well, you might not believe me when I say this, but it's actually true. HHVM lies sometimes. Here's, yeah, no, I know. I, I know. Um, so, so it turns out that uh, Facebook doesn't care about sessions at all. So they kind of wonk the session manager. They, the session manager in PHP inherently locks for obvious purposes, not to corrupt your file. So say you have two web requests coming in at the same time using the same session ID. It locks the one that comes in first so that by the time the second one comes in, it has to block and wait on it. So that way, not two are writing to the same session at the same time. HHVM doesn't actually care. It doesn't bother to lock. So you get this thing where you try to test WordPress on HHVM, for example, on a logged in page, and you get super fast requests. And I can't figure out why. So I dug into it, and I realized, oh, it was just completely corrupting the session. Because every time you were doing the logged in thing, all of the requests were hitting the same session at the same time. And so you're getting more requests per second than you were with PHP 7. It turns out that that's actually bad, because you're corrupting the session. So that's not HHVM being more performant than PHP. That's kind of a lie. Um, but yeah, there, there's there's a lot of things that um, so we looked at initially. So with PHPNG, and this is really confusing, but like with with PHPNG, we we were looking at how to like benchmark some of these changes as they were happening because they started off in a branch that was sort of a secret. So this was like the guy that was like one of the first people to start working on this end engine, um, and he was thinking he's looking at HHVM, he's looking at all the hype that people are making about HHVM. He's thinking to himself, well, man, these guys are beating me at my own game. You know, so he's kind of mad about that. He's like, I want to win. So he came up. He started working on this branch, um, and it was very experimental at the time. But he started working on this branch and trying to figure out ways to get PHP to do less instructions for the same amount of code. So if you're not aware, PHP does compile code down into opcodes or bytecodes, and essentially what that means is that we take the PHP code that's really big and we break it down these very small things that are just simple instructions that get carried out, just like your, your, your programs in C would get compiled down to like x86, right? So they're very simple instructions, but they only run inside of the PHP virtual machine. So as we're making the changes, ultimately we're reducing the amount of instructions that it takes to run the same code, and we're getting better and better results, um, and that's kind of how PHP 7 came to be. Um, a lot of this also had to do with compacting data structures. So arrays that we looked at just a moment ago are no longer, they don't look like that anymore. They're actually, I think, yeah. So they're actually very different now. Um, so you have this like, okay, so the Zend array pointer, which is a really weird thing, but basically this is like this 8-bit flag for types and then is array for another 8-bit flag. And then here, excuse me, you have the um, actual Zend array itself, which has some like garbage collection info, some flags, um, and then another like ref count pointer at the end there. Now, 
the, the changes that come out of this actually turned out to be very beneficial in terms of like, if, so if you benchmark iterating um, over an array doing copy on write, for example, invoking copy on write in PHP, in PHP 7, it turns out to be an order of magnitude faster. Um, at least according to my last test, this may have changed, but it turns out to be about an order of magnitude faster than PHP 5.6. So if, if PHP 7 is not production ready, so like don't go like upgrading your PHP to 7 just yet, but if you are having serious performance issues, upgrade first, right? Upgrade to PHP 5.6 at least, or 5.5 if you can't go to 5.6, although there's not much change. Um, because if you do, you're going to get the inherent performance benefits out of the upgrade much faster and much more obviously than spending a great deal of time refactoring your own code. So seriously, if you have PHP problems, my, my best advice is upgrade. And then when PHP 7 becomes production ready, hopefully, um, you can upgrade to that and you're going to see massive performance gains. In some cases, it actually turns out to be HHVM with an opcode cache just because it does a lot of the same tricks that HHVM now does, like compacting arrays on the fly. Um, it's, it's tricky, it's hard to do, but some people are actually figuring out really clever ways to do this. And one of the key benefits behind this stuff being open source, HHVM and PHP, is that we can, we can take implementations from one another, right? So like, uh, Facebook originally came up with generators, and then we copied them into PHP. Um, they also came up with uh, scalar type hints, a good way to do it. We tried to copy them into PHP, that didn't work. That one was that one was a little bit of a, an awkward one, but that was more politics than anything else. But there there are great things that you can do with PHP these days that you weren't that at some point you weren't actually able to do. So like, for example, you can do event driven PHP these days. There's actually an extension for it now. Somebody's been working. Best thing that PHP has is its stream API. It's really good internally, and it's really easy to extend. So that's pretty much what I have for you today on PHP. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Yeah, that's a good question. So it turned not re not really. Um, here's why: most of the dis sure. So the the question is which is, is compiling PHP versus like using your distributions package manager to install PHP? Is that going to offer you some kind of performance gain? In truth, not really. Very minimal performance gains can come out of that, and the reason for that is because it depends on your particular environment, the kind of gains you can get out of compiling PHP, for example, say like you want to, okay, say you want to compile all of the extensions in statically as opposed to having them loaded as a shared object dynamically. That gives you some benefits in terms of like actual forking. The cost of forking the process is pretty expensive. And when you refork, you don't necessarily, sh you have to copy some of the pointers over in terms of getting the shared object loaded into the next binary as you, as you fork the child. It gives you slightly more overhead because it has to be done dynamically. If you do it statically, it can actually be done simpler. I think the newer Linux kernels probably have a, have something to do with this, but like it, it actually works a little better, but the, the performance gain there is so minimal because usually your, your PHP process being reused for like say a couple thousand requests before it gets forked again, like before it gets killed and then you fork off another child. So very minimal gains there. In terms of like actual like speed performance gains, not really because you're going to get from the package manager, you usually, they do a great job of like separating out all the extensions into different packages and they usually, they usually do like their own security backporting too. So the headache of maybe like compiling your own PHP and maintaining that might not be worth the trade-off. Okay, so that's a really, really good question. So what we're saying, but the question is, if we remove all of the bloat, like the ORM and, and things like that from the code, what kind of performance gains are we going to see? Um, honestly, in my experience, what I've seen um, is, is most guys, they, you know, I, I, I've done a lot of consulting work early on in the years, and, and uh, what I've seen is I come in and people are like, oh, it's the ORM, it's, it's causing us all these problems, and it's so, I'm like, sure, it couldn't be your code, that's, that's the problem, right? Uh, but when I, when I look deeply enough, I find that actually, it turns out most of the time, like removing the bloat, like doing like this inlining stuff, it, it, while yes, it can give you a, a performance gain and, and sometimes a very significant one, um, it's not usually your biggest bottleneck. What I like to do is actually profile the code, figure out what the, what the real large bottleneck is, the biggest one, and figure out how, so if you, if you find that the ORM is indeed the biggest bottleneck, sure, take it out. There's, there's not, it's not impossible to, to write code without an ORM. But then, but then, you know, what are, what are the other developers going to think of you if, if they're not so good with the SQL? I mean, that's, that's kind of a hard balance. But the kinds of performance gains you get from removing PHP code usually 
usually is not that great unless the code was really, really bad. Yeah, and usually, usually the bad code is pretty obvious, right? It's like this, this, this one like nested twenty nested for loops that basically could have been done in one loop. That yeah, that's that's the most obvious game. That's that's the one I'd be looking for. Not like, yeah, but not like removing the entire ORM or like, that's not the first thing I would go for. That's, that's a great question. So the question is, is there a timeline for the release of PHP seven? And actually, I've been so out of the loop on this. Um, I haven't done PHP internals in like the last six months because like I've been so busy at work. But um, I think the last I heard, the timeline was supposed to be sometime in the summer of this year. Uh, usually that always gets pushed back. So you can probably go to wiki.php.net and I'm sure there's some RFC on there that like has timelines. That would probably be the most accurate information. The question is how do you do function synchronization in PHP? Um, are, are you referring to event driven PHP? Is that, is that oh, financial yeah. transactions? So like how do you do, how do you make sure that the transaction uh, works well with all of your functions pretty much? Okay. So that's that's kind of an interesting question because I think that um, in terms of transactions, like in terms of like database transactions specifically, um, PHP doesn't have a lot in the way of doing that. The best I know of is the MySQLi library, which actually lets you talk sort of um, directly to the API in terms of like doing tra like sending the transaction, running it, and, and, and making sure that it goes through. Um, I, I I actually I don't know. I think that probably in terms of like Making sure things are, are synchronized, you could you could use callbacks because PHP now has like callable type hint, and you can make because PHP always you know runs procedurally pretty much like it's it's going to run line by line. So like if you set up callbacks and make sure that those callbacks are all called directly and then have exceptions somewhere in there and handle the exceptions, then you could probably get away with that. I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm probably not too clear on on what the uh, what the parameters of that transaction. Oh are. oh so like synchronize. A method and a variable. Se well, you can use so you can use semaphores in PHP. You can have a semaphore. There's an extension for it. The best option, I probably stick. You know, it's it's hard to say like without knowing the use case. I'd probably stick. What I what I recommend usually is sticking to objects, because the thing about objects is they're more referency than references themselves. You pass an object around to different functions. It doesn't matter what the, like, it's its name versus name value. Um, it doesn't matter what, what the name of the variable is. The object itself stays in memory as long as there's an instance of that object somewhere in code. And I think people usually do that by, like, having, like, some singleton pattern or, like, some global registry. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. But we could talk about that more later, too. Oh, Google. No, I didn't, did, did I say that? I didn't say Google's working with PHP. Oh, 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 so th yes, he is an engineer at Google. He is not doing it for Google. That was a, that was his own personal project. Okay, good question though. The question was was uh, is Google working on PHP? No. Yeah. Okay, so the question is is APC being discontinued? Um, it's actually tr so APC will will exist as long as it's in the pickle repository, right? It's not going to go away. Um, whether or not people want to maintain it is a totally different question. M my understanding is that. No, nobody wants to really maintain it, but there is one guy. There is one guy that still kind of like is for ABC. His name is Joe Watkins. He, he's from England, and uh, he's actually a really great guy. He worked on PHP DBG and a lot of the other uh, great PHP extensions, like PHP Threads for PHP. Um, he's still kind of my understanding is he still kind of works on it a little bit. I don't know if he's gonna like want to continue to maintain it forever, but he's the only one like it's like it's so it's like it's it's voodoo dark black magic to like look at apc code to think like how do you even do this that i don't think anybody will want to maintain it and while it is kind of going away the apc user cache part of it is like been forked into a separate extension it's still there and it's still pretty usable um and it should work fairly well some people get trouble with it like when they run it with opcache but i think there's a patch for like some of the some of the quirks in 56 that you can you could do. We could talk about that more later too. N no, so it, ha it has no replacement, right? So like op cache is just for the opcode cache, whereas what we're talking about, uh, I was referring to the user cache side of APC. Right. The the actual the user. So you can stick data into APC as well as you can stick like the opcodes, the compiled PHP. Op cache is just pure opcode cache for the PHP. the yeah the op cache from Zen. Yeah, yeah. That's in that's that was in you can install it in five three two. It has it has. Right, there's no user cache, unfortunately. That's because a lot of the complexities that came out of APC with the user cache versus op cache is that they use the same locking mechanism. 
And so when you want to access the user the user data port as opposed to the op, like they happen at the same time, you get all these kind of weird quirks and you get sick faults out of nowhere. And yeah, it's that that was one of its biggest problems. What's my take on race conditions so in, I think in PHP? tend to happen as a... So PHP has this very primitive concurrency model in terms of like how it actually works. So every time you get a request, you have this, concur this, this sort of like isolated process that doesn't know anything. It's a shared nothing architecture. doesn't know anything about its neighbors. Um, and it kind of works inside of its own isolated environment. The kinds of race conditions that you typically deal with in PHP have a lot to do with your actual data, right? So like race conditions with like updating the database or updating memcached. And usually, usually those are pretty well solved problems, right? So you can like the database usually has some prop solution for that. The memcache has like the cause, like you can get the the actual token for like updating memcache. So they're pretty well solved problems. The only kinds of risk conditions you're dealing with in PHP directly is if like you're dealing with I/O. So like you you're opening a file and then two requests come in at the same time. You kind of open the same file and over corrupt the file. Um, dealing with those usually, what I say is just don't do it. Just like don't do that stuff in PHP. Like there are better solutions out there. There really are. Um, yeah. Just so just the question is, any feedback on distributed session storage? I think distributed session storage is probably like one of the one of the most complicated problems. I don't know why. It's actually to me it seems like a simple problem, but it turns out that it, it is really complicated. What most people end up doing at certain scales, what I've seen. Um, and I've seen this at Tumblr, is like just get away from the session. Just don't have a session at all. And kind of like deal with things differently, like like figure out a better way to, to, to do things, like s more caching in the in the client, I guess. But um, I think I think memcached works well enough that if so like if you have a distributed memcache cluster, um, and if you haven't like heard about Twem Proxy, it's a project came out of Twitter, it's open source, so you can go to like Twitter's GitHub and, and find it. Um, it's basically like a load balancer for memcached, and if you ha if you're having like distributed session problems, go with that because that's going to like solve all your problems right there in a nutshell, um, and and stick with memcached just because it's the easiest to use, um, and like in in terms of like using alternative solutions like Redis, I believe there are also some some alternatives out there, uh, but don't go with file based storage for sessions if you're distributed because that's just never going to work, right? Like some people try to do like they'll mount like a you know a shared network drive or something and you get all these weird errors, just go with memcache. It's the easiest, right? I think that's that's probably the best advice I would give anyone. So what about using FPM with Apache versus Nginx? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. So I have tried using FPM with Apache, and what I found that is it still works just the same. Uh, you c I mean, you can use FastCGI in Apache, right? It's not, it's not a huge problem. Um, and it works pretty more or less the same, but like for me, it just doesn't make sense because Apache was already built and designed to like have these loadable shared modules. Whereas something like Nginx, you have to literally compile it into the binary. There's no way to just like load a shared object into Nginx. Like it was was designed like this really good static server. Apache from the beginning was was designed the other way around. So I think it just makes more sense to go with with that solution than do unless you're running one server, right? So you got one server doing everything, then you can't really like, separate the static routes into another like Nginx server or something. Then then yeah, probably maybe if you still want to use Apache, go with Apache and fast CGI. Same exact thing. But some people still complain that Apache is a little bit slower. I don't know. So the the question is is there a tool set that I'm that I'm using oh, for profiling? Yeah. So is is there a tool that I'm I'm using for profiling? There are a couple of tools that I like to use in terms of like profiling PHP code. Um, one of them is obviously xdebug, just because it, it can give you the, the cache grind dump uh, from, from the code directly. Um, and you can use something like kcache grind to like look at that. Uh, PHP dbg works wonders on the command line. If you've not used PHP dbg before, go like it's in it's in 55 it's an extension as well you can you can uh, go get that it's 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 basically like a, an entire server api wrapped into a php binary that gives you the benefits of like using a command line debugger to step through code and like profile memory and do all this really interesting stuff but it's command line based so most people want to do their stuff on the web um, and if you want to do that you could still like trick it i guess you could run like the web API, like you can run dash s from the command line. It acts like the internal built-in server. Um, but yeah, I mean that that's one that's also a really good tool. If you're profiling PHP memory, don't ever try to do it from inside PHP. It just doesn't work. Um, use Valgrind instead. It's a really good memory profiler. Can really dig into the like if you compile PHP with the debug symbols, then you can definitely use Valgrind to like dig into it and figure out exactly what's going on in the memory. If like if if you're an extension writer and you're writing your own PHP extension, that's a great tool to have. 
Um, so yeah, those those are mainly the tools that I use in terms of profiling. And then there are like a few other tr like personal tools that I wrote, like custom extensions that like from way back. Like there's things you can't just do in P like for example, you can't figure out what the ref what a variable references from inside PHP, right? There's just no way to do that. So I like wrote like and to me it seemed like a very simple thing. So I wrote a custom extension that literally just takes the symbol table, figures out exactly what references what, and based on the variable name tells you exactly what that variable references. Um, it's a simple thing, but it's like something that doesn't actually exist. But like, if you ever needed it, uh, probably you did something really wrong. Um, yeah, which I did. 